Starting us off at number 10, we have the quagga. Once a prolific subspecies of zebra across South Africa, the quagga was sadly hunted to extinction in the 19th century. The decline in population all started after European colonists took to South Africa and hunted the species nearly into the ground as it competed with domesticated animals for forage. By 1878, the wild population was decimated, although some were taken to zoos in Europe in an effort to rehabilitate, but tragically in the end, the breeding programs were unsuccessful and the last captive quagga died in Amsterdam in 1883. That was until about a hundred years later when the quagga became the first extinct animal whose DNA was analyzed and it was then that scientists discovered just how close a match they were to the plains zebra. By 1987, the quagga project began and their mission is to recreate the phenotype of hair coat pattern by selectively breeding the genetically closest subspecies, which as we now know is the zebra. The first first full of this project was born in 1988 and since its early days they have seen quite a bit of success. If all goes well, the selectively bred quagga like zebras will be released back into the wild. Coming in at number 9, the Cuban macaw. Prior to the 15th century, these vibrant and colorful birds could be found all over the main island of Cuba. But when Europeans landed, they had other plans for these parrots. Although indigenous populations had hunted the species prior to the colonists' invasion, once the Europeans arrived, the amount soared. Many were hunted or traded, while others were sent back off to Europe to live as cage birds, and eventually, by the late 19th century, between the rampant overhunting and habitat destruction, the very last of the Cuban macaws died, making the species extinct. But according to the British writer Errol Fuller, aviculturists are rumored to have bred birds similar in appearance to the Cuban macaw using the genes of a sister species. So who knows, we could be seeing them fly around Cuba in the near future. Coming in at number 8, the Arabian Oryx. Historically speaking, the Arabian Oryx could have been seen roaming around throughout most of the Middle East. But by the time the late 19th century rolled around, you were not likely to see one outside of Saudi Arabia. And in the 1930s, the only remaining populations were found either in the Nafa Desert in the north or the Ruba Kali in the south. Tragically, it only got worse from there. Starting in the 1930s, it became fairly customary for Arabian princes and oil companies to hunt down the animal and eventually the hunts grew to employ as many as 300 vehicles at once. By the middle of the 20th century, the northern population was effectively extinct and finally the last Arabian oryx died in 1972. Thankfully, a few people had the forethought to send a couple off into captivity and they were effectively reintroduced into the wild a few years later. That being said, they are still an endangered animal, but interestingly, it is the first animal to revert to a vulnerable species after being declared extinct. So, it's definitely getting better. Coming in at number 7, Caspian Tigers. During their prime, Caspian Tigers could be found in Turkey and through much of Central Asia, including Iran, Iraq, and Northwestern China. But with the Russian colonization of Turkestan during the late 19th century, their population began to be threatened. The first problem was obviously that the tigers were being hunted by large parties of sportsmen or military personnel. Until the early 20th century, the army was used to clear predators from forests around settlements and potential agricultural lands. In fact, until World War I, about 50 tigers were killed in the forests each year. By the 50s, they became an officially protected species, but even so, by the 1970s, the last remaining Caspian tigers were gone. However, according to recent findings that the Siberian tiger is the closest relative to the Caspian tiger, discussions have been started about introducing the Siberian tiger into a safe space in Central Asia. And hopefully, if they get it right, the tiger would adapt and live successfully where the Caspian tiger once roamed. Coming in at number 6, Heath Hens. 
Once an extremely common bird, heath hens were a subspecies of prairie chicken that could have been found just about anywhere across North America in colonial times. However, like many other species, the population was deeply affected by colonizers who hunted them extensively for food. In fact, it has been speculated that at the first Thanksgiving, it was actually heath hens that were served, not wild turkey. However, by the time the 18th century rolled around, the heath hens developed a reputation as being the poor man's food, as it was cheap and plentiful. And as the hunting continued to soar, the heath hens became more and more of a distant memory. By the 18th in the 70s, the animal was virtually extinct from the mainland with only a few hundred left on Martha's Vineyard, until eventually the late 19th century put a hunting ban in to try and keep the species alive after an estimated 70 remained. This worked for a while, but due to a myriad of problems, the last remaining heath hen died in 1932. But there is still hope for them to return. As they are closely related to the prairie chicken, scientists have started researching projects aiming at the de-extinction of the animal using DNA from preserved cells as a basis for restructuring the DNA of greater prairie chickens. So with any luck, heath hens could be roaming around soon again. Coming in at number 5, Oryx. Considered to be the wild ancestor of modern domestic cattle, oryx were a species of large cattle that once lived in Europe, Asia, and North Africa. And when I say large, I mean large. Apparently oryx could reach a height of 6.6 .6 feet at the shoulder and weigh up to 3,000 pounds. However, due to hunting and habitation loss, the oryx became extinct when the last individual died in 1627. However, recreating the extinct species may not be an out of this world thought according to scientists. Starting back in the 1920s, Heinz Heck, a German biologist, initiated a selective breeding program where he attempted to breed back the oryx using several cattle breeds. Essentially, the idea was to breed out what they had been domesticated for, and the result was called Heck cattle. By the 1980s, herds of heck cattle were released into the Netherlands and since, heck cattle have been crossbred with other European cattle breeds in the hopes of creating a more orcs-like cow. Coming in at number 4, the dodo. Maybe the most recognizable of any extinct species due to just how straight up bananas this bird looked was the dodo. Once upon a time it was found exclusively on the island of Mauritius, but what was most fascinating about the dodo was that it evolved without any natural predators. However, like many animals that evolved in isolation, the dodo was entirely fearless of humans. However, this fearlessness coupled with its inability to fly unfortunately made the dodo an all too easy target for sailors. Although contrary to popular belief, it wasn't just hunting that took out the dodos, but the introduction of other animals like monkeys and pigs into their habitat who destroyed their nests and forced them into a competition for limited resources as well. So have these cartoon looking birds actually been brought back since their 17th century extinction? To be honest, not technically. But scientists are trying. Beth Shapiro, a professor of ecology and evolutionary biology at the University of California, said that she has completed fully sequencing the dodo's genome from an ancient DNA based on genetic material extracted from dodo remains. And the next steps are in the works. Next up at number 3, the Tasmanian Tiger. The Tasmanian Tiger was once a carnivorous marsupial native to the Australian mainland as well as the islands of Tasmania and New Guinea. But beginning in the 19th century, they were perceived as a threat to the livestock of farmers, so overhunting was eventually the largest factor in their demise. Sadly, the last of the Tasmanian Tigers was illegally captured in 1936 by Elias Churchill and sold off to a zoo where she stayed until her death. 
But a return of the Tasmanian tiger could very well happen in our lifetime. In 1999, the Australian Museum began a cloning project for the animal, an endeavor that was initially dismissed as a publicity stunt. But in 2002, researchers successfully extracted replicable DNA from the specimens. Now, fast forward to August of last year, and the University of Melbourne announced it will be partnering with a company called Colossal Biosciences to attempt to recreate the animal using its closest living relative and return it to Tasmania. Coming in at number two, the woolly mammoth. I'm sure we're all familiar with the gigantic fuzzy ancestor to the elephant because, well, it's probably one of the most famous extinct species recorded. The last isolated population of woolly mammoths lived on Wrangell Island in the Arctic Ocean until roughly 4,000 years ago, and famously the first actual remains of the behemoth were found in Siberia in the late 18th century. Interestingly, at first, the researchers studying them were incredibly confused because they could not understand how a warm climate animal such as an elephant could have wound up in such a freezing cold area. But eventually, they put all the pieces together and came to the realization that what they had found were the remains of an extinct animal. Amazingly, since those first few skeptical years, thanks to the cold temperatures in the Arctic, the carcasses of the extinct creature have been super well preserved by ice allowing scientists to access the DNA in ways that is not always possible. And thanks to that, it is apparently in the works to try and bring the beasts back into the world. In fact, after a genome project for the mammoth was completed in 2015, it has been proposed the species could be revived through various means. So while it hasn't happened just yet, by the sounds of it, it could be any day now. And last up in our number one spot, the Pyrenean Ibex. While there are many genetic testings in the works along with breeding of similarly extinct species with the hopes of adaptation, if we are talking about an actually extinct animal that has been successfully brought back to life, then the Pyrenean Ibex is in a league of its own. During its prime, it was often found in areas like France, Portugal, Spain, and Andorra. However, starting in the late 19th century, their population began to dwindle until eventually the Pyrenean Ibex was officially declared extinct in 2000. But the amazing thing about this animal is that unlike any of the others on this list, three years after the last one died, scientists used its frozen cells to clone a calf, making it the first and only animal to have a living specimen exist post extinction. Now, the caveat is that sadly the clone did not survive long after birth. It actually died a few minutes later due to a lung defect. But it did prove that it could be possible to actually bring a species back from the dead. Kicking off the list at number 10, the stellar sea cow. Stellar indeed. Okay, the stellar sea cow was named after George Wilhelm Steller, who discovered this massive creature in 1741 during the Vitus Bering's Great Northern Expedition. They found her right after the crew became shipwrecked. What a lovely surprise to an otherwise horrible situation. They were around over 2.6 million years ago, and they were no match for humans. They only swam about a meter deep, and once humans came into the picture with, you know, hunting and aggression and everything, they were quite easy to hunt. George Steller commented that the animals had an uncommon love for their families, which in turn made it even easier for us to hunt them. Considering the one year gestation period, the species just couldn't reproduce fast enough to keep up with our hunting. But this list, we have a little hope now, don't we? Scientists were able to sequence the genome, which could mean we could see the creature again one day. Hopefully. The answer may lie right now in the DNA of a dugong. Dugongs are the cow of the sea. You know what, they're great. Let's have all the cows of all seas back immediately. Number nine, passenger pigeons. The passenger pigeon once ruled the skies over Canada as recently as the 19th century. Billions of these bright orange birds would just paint the skies. They would fly in flocks so large, it would block out the sun for a short amount of time. Isn't that beautiful? It's like some Lion King stuff right there. But only a few decades passed and passenger pigeons are now no more. So what happened? Well, the very last passenger pigeon, her name was Martha. She passed away in the Cincinnati Zoo back in 1914. So we took a look at her DNA to see if Martha held any secrets to her extinction. They discovered Martha had a low genetic diversity for such a growing population. Natural selection and hunting obviously just eliminated the coolest looking bird out there by far. A little different than the pigeons we have today, that's for sure. The last one died in 1914, but in 2019, paleontologists found remains of the pigeon protected in indigenous lands in Canada, up in Northwest Territories. They blended passenger pigeon DNA with Archaeopteryx dinosaur DNA. Yeah, we're bringing back pigeons with a hint of Oh, dinosaur. 
What could go wrong? Number eight, the woolly mammoth. It was announced only months ago that a team of scientists and entrepreneurs over at a company called Colossal are planning to bring back, are planning to bring the woolly mammoth back to life. That's just the thing we need right now in this world. Out of all the problems, we're like, you know what could solve it? The woolly mammoth, for sure. That'll bring jobs back. The Siberian tundra thousands of years ago was once full of these woolly mammoths, but climate change began to slow them down just a little bit. And humans also needed food, so that surely didn't help. These guys provided warmth and, well, look at them, obviously, a lot of food. Genetics company Colossal raised over $15 million to try and bring this thing back to life. Honestly, I hope it works, but then, I mean, now what? All these things are great scientifically, but it's like, and then what? Number seven, the dodo bird. Speaking of the devil, this is, we're definitely gonna eat these guys. Dodo birds were once big and beautiful. These flightless ground nesting birds once filled the island of Meritius, located in the Indian Ocean. They had massive talons, they were big gray and blue, and they didn't have any natural predator, which is pretty sweet. They didn't have one until we came along. Around 1507, the island was discovered by Portuguese sailors, and, well, the rest is history. They were the easiest bird to hunt, hence the phrase, dead as a dodo. They weren't just loved by sailors either, we're not just 100% here to blame, you know? Monkeys, rats, pigs, any animal that made its way to the island easily had their eggs for lunch. So yeah, it didn't take a long time for the dodo bird population to be completely wiped out. The last dodo was hunted in 1681, but, can we bring back the dodo bird? Are we doing it? I think we're gonna do it. Scientists found an extremely well-preserved dodo skeleton back in 2007, so we may have a chance at picking some DNA apart here. A research facility near Melbourne, Australia is currently trying to use pigeon genes to bring this bird back to life. I mean, I'm all for the idea of bringing back an animal. Scientifically, that's a feat in itself, but do we really think nobody's gonna make dodo chicken wings? I'm just saying. That's just a problem waiting to happen. Number six, Pyrenean Ibex. The last Pyrenean Ibex was a female named Celia. A falling tree sadly killed her in 2000. She was a subspecies of the Spanish Ibex, and the Pyrenean Ibex were native to the Pyrenees Mountains on the border of Spain and France, as her name hints towards. Back in the medieval ages, though, their population was reduced drastically to an endangered level. So it wasn't just recently, it was way back, you know, because of, again, Hi, we got hungry. They were all over the place and knights and swords and bows and armies to feed. They were hunted down, sadly. Disease spread by humans also played an important role in their demise during this time. The Pyrenean Ibex was successfully cloned and brought back from extinction for seven minutes. So we actually did this one. DNA from the last living lady was implanted in the womb of a domestic goat. Lung complications are why the clone didn't last, but listen to what I just said. They made a clone. Seven minutes is a start. I think I could handle a clone of myself for seven minutes, and then after that, I'm tapping out. Number five, Tasmanian tiger. Once native to Australia, the Tasmanian tiger, also known as the thylakine. It was a massive carnivorous marsupial that went extinct around the 1930s. Major factors here, as you guessed, climate change, hunting, and its genetic diversity wasn't all too great. It was sad on one hand because these beautiful creatures disappeared so recently, but it's recent enough that we have a shot at bringing them back. So we're like, ah, oh, but maybe, maybe. Yeah, imagine looking outside and seeing this thing on your front yard. Are we ready for this? Specimens still remain preserved in jars. Thank God for those jars. About time we open those things up, right? All those jar guys are like, hmm, finally, pull this one out. Already we have some of the Tasmanian tiger genes present after scientists inserted them into a mouse fetus. The Australian Museum has been working hard to bring this beast back to life. They're only still lacking the DNA to fully recreate it. So if you have any jars of Tasmanian tiger parts, you know, help us out, hit those thumbs. Number four, the great auk. Once thriving in colonies off North Atlantic coasts, the great auk would grow to 30 inches long and its tiny wings would be only used to swim. Had little tiny, little wings. The wings were much smaller, they were about 13 centimeters long, little flappy arms. No wonder they couldn't fly, look at these things, oh my God. They were cute, but obviously they were quite defenseless. Around the 1500s, European fishermen discovered this perfect area for hunting, and it just happened to be where most of these great ox were hanging out. Newfoundland looked like the iceberg from Club Penguin, and then we just rolled in and we're like, ho ho ho, we are so hungry. It was packed, so they rapidly declined, and by 1950, the last two known specimens were hunted by a single fisherman on LD Island just off the coast of Iceland. Scientists plan on using genetic information extracted from their fossils or preserved organs. Remember those jars of organs always coming in handy. They plan on editing their DNA in the closest living species, which is now the razor-billed auk. The organization Revive and Restore is behind the wheel on this one, and I'm hoping they pull through. Number three, the MOA. 
This New Zealand bird went extinct about 600 years ago. Moa were these flightless birds, massive, might I add, and archaeologists first discovered its fossil in a cave. Its flesh and everything was still attached. That's the gross part. These ancient birds would reach about five feet tall, and when you think of dinosaurs, you probably think that's quite petite in comparison. These birds stopped flying right after the dinosaurs went extinct. Interesting timing. According to biologist Matthew Phillips from the Australian National University in Canberra, these birds safely roamed the land after they didn't need to make these daring dino escapes in the sky. They walked around, got fat, and would hang out in caves. Honestly, pretty ideal. Phillips says this is an advantage when it comes to birds and evolution because wings, be it big or small, kill energy. So it might seem a little depressing to watch a creature lose the ability to fly, but it's because they're eating good, they're comfortable now. Scientists have now found more MOA DNA from ancient eggshells, so it's possible that we may see these fatties soar the skies once again. Number two, Megatherium. AKA giant ground sloths. That's a bit of a nicer name. Yeah, sloths, let's bring those back. Wait, they're already here, hmm? I'm confused, Taylor. Sloths used to be a lot bigger than we think. We often look at them now for being so slow and silly. The movie Ice Age or Zootopia, they sure didn't help their case. Now, of course, the giant ground sloth is closely related to our modern three-toed sloth, but luckily for us, today's sloths aren't that big. They're not the same size as an elephant, which is pretty sweet. That would be a horror film. If a giant elephant-sized sloth started to climb that tree, slowly, might I add, ugh, I'd be sick. We may be able to bring this one back, although they died off 8,000 years ago. DNA samples were extracted from their hair remains, so the next step now is to develop a fetus in an artificial womb. That's the hard part. That's where science and technology might just do the rest. But as of right now, we just we've got a pile of hair. We're like, maybe. And finally, number one, the gastric brooding frog. I'm a big fan of frogs and toads, all that stuff. Except for when they hatch eggs out of their back. That's arguably the worst thing I've ever seen in my life. We'll maybe show you after, maybe, I don't know. These gastric brooding frogs would swallow their eggs and then hatch them out of their mouth. So if you watch them give birth in reverse, it would be pretty confusing. That would be a horror film. They went extinct back in 1983, but scientists have figured out how to implant these dead cells into a fresh egg from an entirely different frog species. Let's just hope these new ones aren't born out of your back. Number 10, the dodo. In the words of my roommate, dodo. Classic. Perhaps one of the most infamous extinctions known to man was that of the dodo bird. When humans met the dodo bird, they were literally eaten to death within 80 years, I think, of their discovery. They were easy to catch, and as their name suggests, they weren't they weren't the smartest. But guys, there are some really exciting things happening in the world of genetics and finally, scientists are on the way to bringing them back. After collecting various DNA samples in January 2016, the University of California announced that they have completed the genome sequence of the dodo bird, opening a variety of doors. With this new information, scientists may be able to recover enough DNA to create a clone to implant in the eggs of the closely related modern pigeon. <gasps> Number nine, the thylacine. The story of the last known thylacine or Tasmanian tiger is very sad. His name was Benjamin, and after thousands of his species were eradicated for fear that they'd eat Australia's cattle, he was the last one left. He was a resident in the Bomera Sioux in Hobart for a while, until one night, out of neglect, they didn't let him back into the kennel. He died of exposure, and his body was thrown into a dump. So sad. But Michael Archer believes we owe it to Benjamin to bring him back. There is one surviving sample of the thylacine that was pickled, pickled in alcohol. Unfortunately, some of the samples were contaminated by careless human DNA, so people reaching in going, ooh, look, it's so weird, and then dropping it back in. But the teeth contained viable samples. In fact, they were able to splice the thylacine cells successfully with a mouse. Archer even argues that should we be able to bring them back, that they could thrive in the Tasmanian ecosystem still as not much has changed. As we will discover on this list, there's a lot we can do now when it comes to cloning, so it is only a matter of time before we see them again. Number eight, aurochs. You you may have never heard of aurochs, but they are one of the most important creatures to have ever walked this earth. They are the great great grandparents of all living cattle today, so I guess you better thank them for the burger you're barbecuing. Aurochs used to roam all across Europe and were responsible for managing biodiversity through grazing. However, this species was hunted to extinction in 1627, but its DNA still lives on. The Tauros program aims to bring back the aurochs as a functional wild animal by backbreeding its closest relatives. It may not be exactly the same, but they hope to genetically breed this cattle to the point that it resembles as closely as possible the original aurochs, kind of like a modern day equivalent. 
Number seven, the ground sloth. Somebody warn Kristen Bell because I don't know if she will actually be able to handle this. The ground sloth was a massive version of the sloths we know now that existed around 8,000 years ago. Imagine a sloth combined with a giant bear. <laughs> So nice. They make the de-extinction list only because we do have DNA samples that have been extracted from a preserved strand of hair. So it could be done. The biggest problem preventing this, however, is the fact that no surviving relatives are large enough to give birth to it. What? What scientists may be able to do is grow one in an artificial womb, which scientists in the Netherlands say they are within 10 years of perfecting. Number six, the Stellar's sea cow. When I say sea cow, you might imagine the slow and lovable manatee, and you're not entirely wrong. They kind of look like a cross between a manatee and a sea lion. The Stellar sea cow is an extinct Cyrenian marine mammal, which is in the same order as the manatee. It used to live in the North Pacific Ocean during the Pleistocene and Holocene Epoch and was last discovered in 1741 by the Vitus Bering's Great Northern Expedition, but disappeared by the end of the 18th century. Scientists estimate that climate changes as well as Paleolithic human hunting may have been the reason the numbers were already so low even before Europeans made the last strike. Like some others on this list, however, scientists were able to sequence the genome, which could mean we may see these creatures again one day. Number five, elephant shrew. It may surprise you to know that though a lot of big awful things might have happened, some good did come out of 2020. The elephant shrew is just one tiny but apparently mighty example. For just over 50 years, not a single elephant shrew had been spotted, which led scientists to believe that sadly this little long-nosed mouse was a lost species. Since the 1970s, any information derived from the species was found through examinations of historic specimens. But in August 2020, a team of researchers and academics reported the opposite, that they were indeed alive and apparently well. Somehow these little creatures were able to rebuild their numbers and are now thriving across the Horn of Africa once again. Number four, the woolly mammoth. Since the film Ice Age came out, I'm sure a lot of us can't picture the animal without imagining like Ray Romano's voice along with it because that's what we do. But eventually we may not have to use only our imaginations to see real life woolly mammoths. Mammoths preserved in the permafrost in Siberia have given paleogeneticists enough data that they have been able to sequence the woolly mammoth genome, which we already know is super important. With this data, they may be able to clone the creature or edit the genetic material to its closest living relative, the Asian elephant. But it gets even cooler than that. In 2019, scientists from Japan and Russia announced a significant step towards this goal. They were able able to bring cells of the woolly mammoth back to life. They were able to recover cells from the hind leg of a juvenile mammoth they found in Siberia that was uncovered in 2011. They successfully implanted 28,000 year old cell nuclei into mouse cells. So though we may be very far off from actually seeing a mammoth, the kind of technology that's being developed here is astounding. Like it's so cool. Scientists hope that they can use this technology to help prevent whole species from disappearing forever. Bringing back the woolly mammoth has a lot of scientific and ethical boundaries that need to be addressed. For instance, there's social creatures you'd need to bring back a whole herd. How would you introduce them back into the wild? Yada, yada, yada. But how cool is it that extinction in the future may rarely happen again if we can master this technology? Number three, the gastric brooding frog. The cooler name of this amphibian is the Rio Batracus, which were a kind of ground dwelling frog native to Queensland, Australia. It was one of two known frog species that was capable okay, of incubating their offspring within their stomach of the mother. She would swallow her own eggs, her stomach would stop making hydrochloric acid to avoid digestion and transform her stomach into a womb essentially. When the Anywhere from 20 to 25 tadpoles hatched, the mucus from their gills kept the acid at bay, which was super exciting for scientists because then they could figure out how to do that in humans if they were able to study them. But unfortunately, these frogs disappeared almost as soon as they were discovered. Unfortunately, both species of this weird and wonderful genus became extinct around the mid 1980s, but, but the scientists, a part of the appropriately named Lazarus Project, planned to bring it back to life. Previous cell samples of the species collected prior to the 1970s have been preserved for 40 years in a conventional freezer. In 2013, Professor Mike Archer and his colleagues announced they were able to successfully grow early stage cloned embryos containing DNA from the gastric brooding frog. Though it's taking longer than a couple years, the Lazarus Project is still on track to bring this unique creature back to life. But it's also important to know that frogs across the world are dying from the deadly chytrid fungus, and this technology could save them all. 
Number two, the quagga. So they actually have brought this back, kind of. The quagga was a type of zebra that used to roam South Africa in herds before European settlers killed them all. But now scientists in Cape Town figured out how to bring them back. Quaggas had stripes very similar to zebras, but they only appeared on the front half of their bodies and are brown along the rear. Eric Harley, the project's leader, discovered that the key to bringing back this animal was through genetics, of course, as we, we know now. By testing quagga skins, they discovered that they were actually a subspecies of the zebras we know and love. Therefore, it could be possible to manifest the genes through selective breeding and they were right. They are now in the fifth generation of the breeding process and already there are less and less stripes and the appearance of a brown color. The next step would be to see if they can exact the pattern and behavioral differences between the quagga and zebras, not just the coloring. So they still got a long way to go, but really cool. Number one, the Pyrian ebex. So technically, this is the only species to ever go extinct twice. The Pyrian ebex or Bacardo became extinct back in 2000 when a fallen tree fell on the last female Celia. Sad way to go. But scientists were quick to freeze some of the cells in liquid nitrogen. With these cells, they were able to clone a calf in 2003 that was brought to life for only a few minutes before it died. Despite the loss, it was a historic event in history and the first de-extinction. Now they still plan to use the 14 year old cells of Celia, but first they must see if they are still alive. In addition to this, they are also attempting to clone embryos and implant them in female goats. So they did it once. Who is to say they won't be able to do it again, but maybe, maybe with bigger prey. Now, some of the questions that accompany and often oppose the extinction is if we do bring them back, where will we put them? Will they thrive in today's ecosystems or die out again? Should we keep them in a lab? That's no way to live. If we put them in a theme park, well, we all know how that went with Jurassic Park. 